Uh, today's talk is Alec Clues. Um, Alec is a software geek who currently works as a developer relations advocate at Paper Cut Software in Melbourne. Um, he started using Docs's code in 2017 with his old school Unix tools, but has since improved his content productivity with Hugo, Docker, Plat uh, I don't know that, Plantum, Make, and many other tools old and new. He has been working in IT for over 20 years. So without further ado, I will stop sharing and we'll do some jazz hands and we'll let, um, let you take over, Alec. Thank you very much. So thanks, Alicia. And we will be having a very brief look at plant UML a bit later on. So maybe that answers some Thank of you for answering how to pronounce it. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, my apologies for those of you who were inconvenienced by me uh, not making it last week. Um, uh, and thank you for coming along this week. Um, so I'm gonna talk, if I'm gonna get my screen the right focus. I'm gonna talk about, um, about Docker um, for, for documentarians. Uh, who perhaps don't haven't been exposed to much Unix command line stuff. Um, a bit about me. So, as already said, I work as a developer relations advocate. That's somebody who helps developers use APIs, uh, third party developers use APIs. Um, I've been around the block a fair bit. I'm really into technology. Uh, if you ever meet me in real life, then we can have a coffee or a beer maybe. Uh, you can find me on the internet in many of the usual places. Um, but uh, whilst I'm a developer relations advocate and I write a lot of content, I'm actually not a technical writer. And here is the proof in that uh, I sent out a Twitter post today and misspelt it, misspelt something. So that was kind of embarrassing. Um, but there's proof. Okay, so let's talk about modern software documentation. So our goal is to create uh, useful documentation uh, and cycle so at DC4. We've got to be able to find the documents, we've got to be able to understand them. The documentation has to tell us everything we need. The information needs to be correct and the information needs to be current. And I think that kind of covers all the bases. This is what we're aiming for. Um, and we need to do this stuff quickly. Uh, the pace of modern software deployment and, and updates is, is never ending. Uh, and we can't all be hanging around waiting for the documentation team to finish. So the, the solution that's often put forward is docs as code. And I've, I've spoken in quite a few places about docs as code. And obviously a lot of other people have done that as well. Um, but better than I have uh, and it's basically about having the whole team editing and reviewing the content um, so that you get this you get first of all multiple perspectives working collaboratively together on the content um, and you're able to push it out quickly and easily uh, because you've got this really rapid workflow um, but docs code does depend on quite a lot of tooling and automation to make it work properly so so the obvious examples are things like static site generators, but you might also have natural language linting tools to, to check your, to check your uh, content before you publish it. Um, increasingly, as we're documenting APIs, for instance, we're using tools like Redocly or, or a Swag or Open API to provide visualization and interaction with our APIs. So that needs to be published as well. Um, and I use text extraction generation, so I'm actually dynamically creating text content every time it gets republished. So, so all of this um, takes, it's, it's hard to deploy consistently. So, you know, you've, you've got a wide selection of technical writers in your team or potential technical writers, they're, right, they're, they're you know, working on their workstations. Uh, and if you've got to deploy all this tooling uh, across the whole team, it becomes quite easy to break things. Um, you know, different versions of, of packages and things can clash with others and so on and so forth. So it all goes a bit fragile and a bit, a bit fraught to kind of keep up to date. So let's just jump, jump gears a minute. Let's talk about cooking uh, and particularly sort of commercial cooking. So in a commercial cooking environment, farmers and, and sort of primary food producers are creating ingredients and then they're handing all that stuff over to a team of trained chefs who have spent years and years practicing their craft um, and they are using a set of expensive tools uh, in a specialist environment to turn those those sort of that, those ingredients into um, a delicious meal that customers have ordered and want, um, and of course they want it quickly as well. So so typically the chefs are turning out meals in twenty minutes or forty minutes, depending on, on how involved it is, but quite quickly. Um, so having talked about that, what's that? What's what's documentation going to do with cooking? Well, you can sort of think of, about cooking and documentation in the same way. It's a conceptually a simple process. 
you you need ingredients for us it's things like you know restructured text or markdown descriptions of diagrams sample code and so on and at the end of the day all you want to do is be able to publish that whether it's to a static website or to a pdf or or you know some sort of online help file or whatever um and and, and so that's quite simple but to actually get from these sort of ingredients or inputs, content inputs to the final product, it's quite hard because of some of the tools I talked about earlier on, setting them all up, having them working in a pipeline, uh, and they can break quite easily once somebody makes a change to their, to their workstation, everything breaks. Uh, but you want something that just works. You want something simple. And an important point to all this, an important, an important um, motivation is that we want editors to get a high fidelity rendition of the changes they're making so that, for instance they can understand not just the words that they've changed but the way that those words will appear how they relate to the images in the document are the images in the correct place so they need basically a duplication of how the content will look when it's published through uh, the sort of the full-blown CICD publication or, or continuous integration so as we push documents live you know they go through this process we want that same process to happen after each edit on the workstation and everybody across the whole team has got to use the same tools the same sets of tools for the same content so they can get consistent results so i'm going to introduce the concept of the thermomix so thermomix is a commercial a commercial product um, and basically you buy it for your kitchen and it's got lots of functionality all built into one simple box and the concept is you put the ingredients in as per the book you push the right set of buttons on the front and at the end you get a meal. You don't need the fancy kitchen and all the fancy people that I showed in the picture previously. This does it all for you. Okay. So one of the important concepts about the Thermomix, it's easy to use. You don't need special cooking skills. You don't need to have gone to catering college. You add the ingredients to the top. You choose the program you want on the control panel. And at the end of it, you wait and you get a nice meal at the end. You don't actually care what happens inside that box. It just works. And somebody else did a lot of very hard engineering to make it work. And another important thing is that you can, you can take your Thermomix to a friend's house and do exactly the same thing. And it, all you need is a flat service to put it on and power to run it. And if you've got a, if you've got a cheap plastic table, as long as you've got a power supply, that's okay. Or if you've got an expensive um, remodeled kitchen, with a marble top, it'll also work exactly the same way. It doesn't matter the platform in which you run it. You can also create your own recipes, and then of course you can taste them before unleashing them on your friends. So it's got this concept of the of the preview as well. I'll talk about there. So using that, you're using the the same machine not only to create meals that you're giving to people, but to also try out changes and, uh, that you're making to recipes as you go along. So in this context, if I was if I was a geek, which I am, I would call the Thermomix pre-built automation tooling for the kitchen. Um, and Docker is a similar thing for docs. Um, so Docker allows us to pre-package our tools. So some tools I talked about earlier, static site generators and linting tools. We can package them all together and put them into a thing called an image. It's basically a box. Now, when uh, image is a, is a Docker technical term for just a box of files that we can use to, to run things. Uh, it's not an actual picture type image. Once we have our box of tools, we can use it anywhere. So I can take the same image, which contains the same set of tools, and I can run it on a Mac, I can run it on a Windows machine, I can run it on a Linux machine, I can run it on the cloud on a Linux machine, doesn't matter. It behaves exactly the same way, and I can take one image and give it to everybody. Okay, and the concept is content in the top, process it through Docker through a Docker container, and you get docs documentation, final documentation at the bottom. Okay, so before I jump in and start demonstrating, is there any, any anybody want to make uh, have, ask any quick questions? Okay, so that's made it all clear. So I'm going to start, I've got a couple of de demonstration scripts. The first one is going to take us through some basic Docker functionality and allow me to talk about how you do various things. Um, and 
The second one is actually going to take us through the general the creation and use of a Hugo static website. So there's actually some documentation. Now, I'm starting from the command line, and I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it's the easiest way to use Docker still. Um, secondly, it's going to allow me to talk about particular features. But eventually, I don't want you to get scared by the fact I'm showing you the command line, because as we go through, I'm going to show you ways of simplifying the command line use so that it becomes easier for you to use. And eventually, I'm actually going to show you how you can actually avoid the command line altogether. But for this sort of initial, initial showing you how it works, the command line is relevant. I'm also um, here using a Unix prompt, or Linux prompt, I should say. That's irrelevant. You can be use the same thing on PowerShell. It works identically. Uh, if you're on Windows, and obviously this command line interface is identical for um, for uh, Linux and Mac. Okay. Can everybody see the command line? Oh, uh, correctly. But do I need to increase the font size? I can see it well. Does okay. can everybody else see it? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you increase it just a little? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with a program called Figlet, uh, and Figlet is a very simple tool, but it does transform text, and that's what we do a lot of in documentation. So I want to use a program called Figlet. So if I try typing Figlet hello world, I get an error because Figlet is not installed. Uh, now I could install Figlet, but I've got to learn how to install Figlet, which is a bit fiddly, uh, and I, if I'm on Windows, then installing Figlet is actually quite difficult. Um, so I'm going to actually use a pre-existing Docker image. So somebody's already taken Figlet and put it inside of this thing called Docker image, and I can just use that instead. So the way I do that is I install Docker desktop. So if you're on Windows, for instance, you can just do it from the command line. You can also do the same thing on Mac. There are instructions online. Just look up install Docker desktop. Uh, and then once I've actually installed Docker Desktop, I can start using it. So the first thing I want to do is actually download this image. This is like going to the shop and buying a new uh, Thermomix tool, but it's free. So that's actually going on the internet and looking for the most current version of this Figlet image. And the network, my Wi-Fi in my office is a little bit slow. Sometimes it's slower than others. Come on, wakey, wakey. Sometimes Zoom, it can be a bit of an internet hog too. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's, I'm, I'm not gonna go through the details, but that's now just made sure I've got the current, the latest version. So now that I've downloaded this image of Figlet, so again, I wanna emphasize that the image just contains Figlet, nothing else. So it's Figlet in a few settings. Then I can actually run the container with this very long command. I'll talk about this in a bit in a minute. But basically, we just run Figlet latest and say hello world, and that transforms that text into hello world. So let's look at this, this command line a bit. Um, so what we've got here is the command actually runs, runs a container. We've got some housekeeping things. So after the um, after the container is finished running, we want to do some tidy up. So again, I'm going to the details, but just always plus minus minus rm uh, on that, and it tidies up. And we're actually running this this container in the foreground. So we want, we want things to happen on the screen, and we want the keyboard to also be also accept, uh, be accepted. So that's just minus i minus t. So this minus minus rm and minus minus rt are, are very common parameters. The next kind of important thing is the name of the image, okay, which is the one I, I downloaded earlier. So that's actually this package bundle box, which can, only contains Figlet. And the last final thing is the actual input text. And I'll talk more about inputs into containers in a minute, um, but that's, that's what we wanted. And out of that, we got uh, this hello world outputs. So, yeah, does that make sense to everybody so far? Any really lost? You did have a question in the chat about how do you um, how do you know there's an image called Figlet? Um, I did some investigation, uh, so I did a search on the internet looking for uh, Docker container Figlet, 
and it led me there. But you do have to do some some replication. I better I better talk a, a bit about um, what we're not going to be doing. We're not going to be talking about how to deploy Docker to production and how to use Docker to use microservices. This is purely about using Docker in your local environment. So you can be a little more um, gung ho about which images you use. I did do, but I did do some checking um, before I used this to make sure that it, that it didn't look dodgy, and that's just experience. Okay. Now I talked about the fact you know you got these three words: uh, Docker container run minus minus RM minus IT, and most of the time we'll actually be using those all the time. So it's a bit tedious to keep typing that. So I'm gonna save myself some time by creating a function. This is, this is an approach to how you can simplify the Docker inter command line interface by wrapping things in a function. And so with this function here, I've now got this thing called DCRI, which is Docker container run interactive. And instead of typing all that stuff I said before, I can just say DCRI, name me the image and the input stuff. And that will just behave identically. Uh, and it, it behaves before because it's just substitute. It's just substituting the appropriate function definition for this DCRI string. Yep. Now I still think that's too much typing. So what I want to do is make it look like I've actually got Figlet installed. So what I can actually do is define a function called Figlet, which does everything for me. And all I'm expecting is the actual command line parameters that I would normally pass to Figlet. So now I can just say Figlet, hello Homer, and I, it behaves as if Figlet was installed on, on my system. So that's a huge, that's a huge sort of simplification uh, for users. Okay, so far? May I, I ask I need... a question? Sure. That might be uh, maybe relevant for um, very new users. So um, when you define a function basically in your terminal, um, that's only valid as long as the terminal session is the same, Correct. right? Correct. You, okay. need, you, need to, you need to understand functions. If I was using Unix, Linux, I would probably be running aliases instead. Um, but the reasons why I'm using functions here. But yeah, that's a sort of shell. You need to understand how to use the shells. Okay, let's talk a bit about Docker containers. So when I run an image, it's actually becoming a container. So I'm running containers with Docker desktop. Um, an important thing about containers are they are isolated and protected from the underlying workstation. So if I change something in the container, it's not visible outside the container unless I do, do make it visible. And if I, so things that I'm inside the container can't break the workstation. And if I update software or make some change on my workstation, it can't break the container. So that's probably one of, the, one of the reasons that you want to use Docker is because changes in one are not going to break the other. And you've got this got an isolated, isolated environment. Um, you can't read and write files by default. We're going to do that later, but you have to, you have to do something special in order to allow the uh, processes inside the container to actually read file content and to allow the same processes to actually write file content. And also, if you're running something like a web server inside a container, you can't access the network ports, again, unless you make special arrangements, which we'll do later on because we're in Hugo. Uh, so container by default is only has access to the files and content that are provided in the image given to it. It's all part of this isolation. The problem with this is that therefore containers can't do anything useful because any computer program has to be able to do has to be able to read inputs and write outputs in order to do anything at all. So how do we get things in and out? We use command line options to so actually pass information on the command line. We pass environment values. So every program, uh, every computer program, gets this thing called an environment, which is name value pairs, and we can we can set up that environment which, uh, and pass it to a program so that it, it can read those name value pairs. Most, most obvious ways by reading and writing files, we can provide outbound network traffic like a web server does. So it's actually, um, uh, you know, allowing people a browser or something else or an API client to connect to it. Uh, and we can actually read the logs that are produced. So how do we do these things? How do we get information into a container, first of all? Well, we can pass command line parameters. We can pass environment values and we can read file content from the workstation file system. 
via a mechanism called bind mounts. Uh, and just a quick aside, I'm not showing you most Docker container, most Docker features. I'm only showing you and demonstrating specific features that are needed if you're going to do this documentation type workflow. So I've got a new container here called Figlet Greeter, which, which I created. And if I just run Figlet Greeter with no, no parameters, it produces a greeting and the greeting is hello and it greets a subject, which in this case is world. So the defaults are uh, a default greeting and a default subject. But if I pass in a command line parameter, uh, in this case, it's Homer Simpson, then that changes the subject. So the subject is picked up from the command line and that's hello Homer Simpson. I actually had to uh, configure and set up this Docker image to be able to interpret those command line options correctly. It doesn't, it's does not something that comes but for free. Um, but once you've set it up, then it's just usable as is. Now I'm gonna change with an environment variable. So I'm gonna pass information into the container using environment variable. So this is, if you, again, if you're using documentation, documentation generator, you might pass in, whether it's for production or for, uh, pro or for review, and change the behavior of how static site generator works or something like that. So here I've got the minus E option. The name of the environment variable is greeting and its value is do. Uh, and I'm still saying Homer Simpson here. So now we sh sh should be fairly obvious that we get do Homer Simpson. So I've over overrode the greeting, the greeting setting. Now, now we start reading and writing files. So let's talk about reading from a file. So I'm creating a file here called input.txt, which has got Bart Simpson in it. And now I pass some extra parameters. And those extra parameters are, lost my cursor. So um, I've got this mount here. So I've actually done a bind, what's called a bind mount. And I've attached the present working directory, which is all where this, this input.txt file is, into the source directory inside the container. So I created a little link between the file system on my workstation and the file system inside the container because they are, normally they're isolated. So that's sort of overriding that default. So anything, so now the container can read from the source directory and you can see those files. And the thing that's coming after it. Uh, is just some shell magic to make sure that any files that are written by the container have the right user identity so that the, the right permissions are set up correctly and things like that. But just take that as a bit of a bit of magic that just has to be done. Um, and I've actually specified an output, output file as well, which I'll come back to later. So if I hit enter now, it will just run. And I, I not only the input's gone in through a file and the output has been captured in the file, so I won't see any output. Uh, but I will, I will come back to that input and output in a minute. So let me just go back and talk about how you get um, information out of a container. So again, containers are isolated. So we're, we're going to write files to the workstation file system by binary mounts, which is what we'll see just happened. We can also um, serve content through a network port. So we'll see that with, with, a, with a running a web server in a minute. And we can also see information on the log, which you have already seen, but I'll, I'll explain that more explicitly in a minute. So remember that just now I specified an output text file and because of the way I set up the container, it's programmed to read from an input text file and write to an output text file if it sees them. So if I look at this output text file, it's actually written hello Bart symptom because I created an input file that contained Bart Simpson. So that's file input output through what's called this bind mount, which is the connection of local workstation directories into the container directory or into a directory in the container. Right. I'm now going to run the Nginx web server. Okay. Now, um, I've done two things here. I've still, I've, I've mounted using bind the Nginx demo directory 
into a directory inside a container, which is user share nginx HTML. And if you know nginx, the way this is set up is that nginx will attempt to find the index.html file in that directory. But if that is pointing into my nginx demo directory on my workstation, then that's it will see that. And lo and behold, um, if I go into here and look at my nginx demo directory, there is an index.html file. So by running, oh, right. so that, that's how that line mount is working. But also the other thing I've done is I've actually opened up a port. So I'm saying port 80 in the container, which is the, the port that Nginx is publishing on, should be exposed on the host as 8787. So that means on the workstation, if I try and open port 8787, I'm actually going to be looking at port 80 inside the container. So again, it's connecting the network between the workstation and the container. Uh, the other thing that's just talk worth talking about is that I'm using a minus D option here for detach. So it's not gonna be in the foreground, it's gonna be detached and running in the background. Uh, and I'm giving it a name, more about the name in a minute. So we just run this up, it fires. I can't see anything because it's running in the background, but there is on localhost 8787 is the content of Hello Docker Wizards. And if I spring over to my editor, which is running on Windows and change this to a different word, save that away and come back here and refresh, that's that content. So that is Visual Studio on my workstation, updating a file. That file can be seen inside the container and is then read by Nginx to display, uh, to be presented uh, as, through the web server. That Port 80 is mapped to port 8787 on my workstation. So in the workstation, you can go to localhost 8787 and you can see that content from Nginx, even though Nginx is running inside this, this isolated container. Now, uh, logs, let's talk about logs. So we've already seen logs in fact, because by definition, anything that gets written to what normally you would think of as the terminal is counted as a log. So Figlet is writing to what's called standard out. And so it just, it just, the output just goes there. It also, the logs also capture anything that's written to standard error. So if you got programs, generally they'll, they'll often write to standard output, which is what you see on the terminal by default and also standard error, which is also what you see on the terminal by default. Um, if you have a detached container, you don't see that immediately because it's running in the background. But you can actually run run the container logs correct um, command. You can give it the name of the container that you had, which I remember I gave it a name, and you see the log. So this is all the all the log data from Nginx coming out. And there is my Nginx container running in the background, and I can actually stop it by doing an RM. Okay, that was a lot. So any questions? Okay, let's press on. Okay, I've already talked about images. Uh, so image uh, is not a visual image. It's a collection of application files, configuration files, and settings uh, that bundled up allow you to run a tool or multiple tools. Uh, an important distinction is it doesn't contain any operating system files. So for any of you thinking, well, it's just like a virtual machine, that's not quite the case. It's a very lightweight virtual machine because it doesn't contain an operating system. Once you've got an image, it's fixed. Uh, I'll show you how to build new images later, but, but it's fixed. But you can take that single image and you can run it anywhere you want. It doesn't, you don't need a, you don't need a different version of Windows or a different version of Mac or that sort of thing. So that's a huge benefit. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna move on now to a slightly more practical example is Hugo. So last May, um, I did a little demo of Hugo and in the instructions, uh, I said install Hugo locally with a little aside down the bottom saying Docker is an option. So we're basically gonna do the same thing that I, I did um, uh, last, last, you know, last May for the, for the Australian group. And I put a link in the, in the meetup page 
with access to this presentation. So if you want to go back through this because you don't know, you go more than welcome. But we're basically going to follow these instructions um, as, as they were before, but we won't even have Docker installed locally. So let's actually do that. Uh, so this is a Hugo demo. So the first thing is let's try and run Hugo and Hugo is not installed. Now I did look up the Hugo documentation uh, and it said some, it said a few helpful things. And that basically allowed me to decide, well, I can create, I can use Docker container to run Hugo because somebody else has already done the work for me. And I'm using exactly the same things as we've seen before. There's nothing new in here, but it's now specific to Hugo. So uh, we are, we are publishing the Hugo port. So in Hugo, when, when you're serving content from Hugo web server, it all comes out, always comes out on port 1313 and it'll be the same port on our workstation. And also Hugo needs access to our um, content, content files. Uh, so that's just by, done by mounting uh, into this source directory inside Hugo, because that's the way it's set up. And again, a bit of shell magic. And I'm using this, this pre-built image by Clag, Claggy uh, to, to run Hugo. That's all I had to work out. Now, I would expect many of you to be able to, to set this up, but if you've got a friendly uh, developer on staff, they should be able to help set you up, set this up for you, package it up so that you can just run it as you want to. So now I've got this function defined. I can use Hugo as if it was installed. So I can just go new site example project. And if you used Hugo, this is, you know, you'll know this is just standard Hugo instruction uh, um, procedures. So this created an empty project. There they are, um, you know, a few directories and a couple of config files. Um, I've got some, you, you need three things for a Hugo website to work. You need some content, you need a valid Hugo configuration and you need a theme. So let's install the content and config. So I just had it prepared earlier. And now if you look in here, we've got some content under the content directory. And here is a valid Hugo config. Uh, the, last, the next thing I need to do is I need to install a theme. Now every Hugo theme is installed differently. Um, and the instructions for this particular theme that I've chosen assume that you're on a Mac or a Linux box or have access to Unix commands. So rather than kind of make that assumption, what I've done is I've, I'm actually going to provide a Docker command that kind of encapsulates that complexity. Uh, now actually it, it is quite long. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the exact details of how it works, uh, but basically all it's doing is regurgitating or allowing to run the three commands that you need to install this Hugo um, theme. So if I just run that now, there are the three commands, it's doing it for me. And I can run this sort of fragment, which hopefully get packaged into a script or something anywhere. Then we come back and runs anywhere and it would just work. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to. Have, I don't have to assume anything about the user's work environment. That's pretty powerful. So now, if I just look, that's installed the theme. Now, now that that's um, running, let's let's try and look at that. So, I've just popped into localhost thirteen thirteen, which is where I will be looking at the Hugo content. Currently, there's nothing there because Hugo is not running. So, if I run Hugo, and remember that Hugo function is actually going to start a container and start Hugo inside the, and have Hugo run inside the container. And I'm just going to pass in the Hugo options I want. It's going to start the container and then it's going to start, which starts Hugo. Hugo then generates some pages and I can look on localhost 1313 and there's my content. And I didn't have to install Hugo. I didn't have to make a bunch of assumptions about what, what was already installed in my user workstation. It just works because I'm using Docker. It's behaving like a black box. Yeah. Let's just stop this. Now, let's get on to the final sort of topic. And that is how do you create your own images? So an image is fixed, but you can create new custom images and you can get your friendly geek to do that. So when you build a new image, you give it a name 
you always build on top of an existing image. So, I'm gonna, so you take an image and then you add stuff to it to get your new image. So always that. How do you add stuff to it? You um, run the image uh, under the under what's called under the build command, and you can then execute pre existing commands. So, for instance, if you are you, you run package management commands to actually install new packages. Uh, you might run file system commands to make directories that you might need. You might add new user accounts, all sorts of things you do. Anything you can sort of type in at the prompt to do system administration and modify your 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 image, you can you can do. You also uh, will want to add uh, Docker specific information to the image, so things like what's the default startup command, um, what the environment values that it defaults to, and so forth. You can also add metadata. Which is useful for documentation. And the way you do that uh, is with a Docker file. So here's an example Docker file. So remember, there were three things. You always start from a base image. So this is saying, I want to start with, with, the, with the Hugo image that I had before. I'm going to run some commands on it to make changes to that, to that image. I'm going to have some configuration options to this image. And then all I have to do is to say, Docker image build, give it a name, and give it the input from the Docker file. Um, and the different ways of running this build command, this is, this is the simplest approach to building with a Docker file, um, which is what therefore I'm choosing to. When you go look at documentation, it'll often look slightly different. So let's actually run one of those. So this is quite a long command because I've got everything in one place. So here's, here's the actual command and then the actual Docker file. So again, build on top of Hugo, adding some packages, making a directory, downloading a file from the internet, and specifying some config settings. So what happens is now that Docker goes away and builds that for me. And the name that I'm giving this is Hugo underscore plant UML. Okay, and we're gonna use this image in a minute to do something. So, I promised you the last thing I would do is that I would show you how to package all this up so that it be, you don't have to use the command line anymore. So here's an example of I'm providing a shell script uh, that you can just run with PowerShell. And it's going to display a lot of strategic information which we don't need to worry about. And that's just going to sit there and sit there and build our site. And as we make changes to our site, it will rebuild it. So one of the things I did here was I said, um, where am I? So one of the things I did here was that uh, in this content, mm -hmm. I'm using Mermaid to generate a diagram. And there's how you do it. And in fact, if you go back to the index, the correct index.int file, there's the mermaid code. And there's the little explanatory thing saying this is the mermaid code that I used to do that. I don't particularly like mermaid myself, personal preference. Um, we've got a storm coming in, so it's just gone suddenly dark. Let me switch the light on. Um, so, I want to change this and I want to start using plant URL. So what I did earlier on when I built that image was I took Hugo and I did plant the plant URL tool on top. So I can generate plant URL images from plant URL descriptions. So I've actually automated this process. So what I'm going to do is um, go back to here and just enter. Uh, it's going to actually edit the content to reference the PNG file. Uh, and it's actually made that change for me now. So instead of having all that mermaid code, I've now just got a, a markdown reference to an existing image, um, which is that image there. Uh, and I actually put an example in. So if I, if I now look in here, Hugo has automatically, uh, because it's in developer mode, has actually detected that change and refreshed the page. So I'm now getting real time uh, feedback on the contents of my documentation, which is where I wanted to get to. And I'm now using the same set of tools that I will eventually use to deploy to production. So this is a high fidelity rendering of the content. And if I make a change to that image, 
Uh, I'm going to break it uh, for going to here. I'm going to add an S, a couple of Ds onto there and save that. It should build it. And it did. And I've actually broken it. So what happened there was that I detected the change in the plant UML, which is nothing to do with Hugo. I had enough smarts built into my container that it saw that change. It regenerated the image and then because you inside the container and then because Hugo saw that image changed, it refreshed, refreshed the site or refreshed the page. So I'm getting this very tight feedback loop when I'm writing my documentation. That's the win. And the same set of tools can then be given to a reviewer. They can check the code out and they can run the same script and, and, and review the same content. Um, and that's pretty much all I had to say. Um, I will be posting further information. So these slides will be going up uh, on the meetup page. A link will be going up on the meetup page. They are public. Um, and I will be trying to add some further reading into here. There'll also be a GitHub repository with all these demonstration scripts in so that you can have a quick look and you've got my contact details. So you can always reach out to ask me any questions you have about it. Well, thank uh, you so about, much. Oh, go ahead. No, but 45 minutes, I did it. You did it. All right. <laughs> well, let's take um, about maybe five minutes or so and take some questions from the group that is here, if you're interested in that. Um, we did have a question uh, while you were speaking um, or a, a kind of like a, a comment question. Um, and it says, the, the tool seems very developer oriented. Can a documentation team reasonably install, run and operate Docker themselves? So it depends on the team. Um, and, uh, and I'm not suggesting for my moment that, that somebody from a tech writing background, traditional tech writing background should ever do this. This is why I, I talked about having a friendly geek available. And you know, if you look, if you look at other um, technical docs code, so introductory texts, they often talk about you know making use of your development team to help you get the tooling set up, and that's another example of this. So you know, other people need to you know installing Docker desktop is easy. Writing the wrappers and the scripts is a lot more involved, and, and writing the writing the Docker files to generate the right images is a is a lot more involved. So that's you definitely. I'll need some technical chops for that. There are some great training courses out there, though. Um, go ahead and feel free to ask additional questions either in the chat or you're welcome to come off mute, raise your hand using the raise hand function if you'd like. Um, while we're waiting for a few more questions, I have a question. So um, I get that it's really this is a great tool for us to be able to preview um, the docs as they will appear on a website or something like that. Um, and that makes sense for that use case scenario for me, but it also occurs to me that you could, um, w one of the challenges that a lot of developer, or sorry, technical writers experience is having a working dev environment with the latest changes from dev um, so that they can begin working on the documentation. Uh, can Docker solve those kind of problems too by helping to kind of build um, the, the environment for the tool that is currently in development? It, it can definitely, but you're kind of dependent on the development team already using that. So for instance, my, my, my team don't. Uh, they, they build on their desktops. So there'll be a huge amount of work to actually get on Docker now. Slowly, I think they're changing. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think really you depend on the developer team to, to have done the work for you there. Yeah, that's always my challenge as a writer, like get me the dev environment. <laughs> anyway, that's great. Um, so we have two more questions in the chat. Um, can you show an example of content you've output for end users with this tool chain? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is actually not yet public, but it will be going public soonish. So I'm happy to, I think, I think I've think i shared it before. Uh, I'm trying to remember where it is. So I, so I use GitLab currently as my CI CD in repository. Um, and so 
Um, I'm actually using GitLab to generate to do my platform building. So here, here is. Oh, oh you you stopped sharing not, your screen. So yeah, I did. Did I? City, city person. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. So this is all done with Docker. Um, and it was quite interesting the other day because I said to developers, because a lot of developers write some of our reference docs. Uh, we use Dockly down here to, to uh, generate this, this open API stuff. And, and they, uh, they actually should be using a Docker and a workflow uh, to automate the validation of this content and they didn't do that. Uh, and so they actually pushed errors to, to uh, production effectively. I was very sarcastic to them. <laughs> that's why you have to preview the docs. <laughs> well, that's right. They, they were previewing them. So there is a markdown viewer in, um, in Visual Studio Code, which they're depending on, but it's not the same as using the renderer that you're actually going to use in production. I can't emphasize that enough. Definitely. Okay, we've got a question from Cameron. Hi, Cameron. I'm guessing there will be version mismatch problems somewhere, maybe in the source Docker image, which might get out of date. No, so so, well, I th so you can interpret that question a number of ways. The short answer is no, the whole point of Docker is because everything's isolated. If something up version somewhere, it doesn't matter because you, you have got a static view of the world. And if that works now, it'll work next, it, it, you know, it should work in, in six months time because it hasn't changed. Now, if, 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 so, if something needs to change in that image because you know, it, it's taking stuff from the outside world, like, you know, a, a version of the software, they need to have some mechanism to update that image on a regular basis. As an example, um, when I change the way that uh, I do documentation, then the Docker, the Docker image that has all documentation tools in it. So for instance, recently I changed this to include spell checking. So I needed to add the A spell, A checker into the Docker container so that it would, it would allow automated spell checking. And so I actually had to change Docker containers and that, that, you know, I had to then tell people, you must download the new image because it's changed. So that, that, that is kind of one problem that, that, you know, people could be running out of date images, but it, it's not going to break anything locally. I mean, if, if the image works, it will keep working. It just may not have all the greatest features in it. Does that, that answer the sense. question? I hope so. Uh, we have a few more questions. Um, someone just commented uh, about the fear of breaking something being very real for non-developers. What's an example of something that can be broken? Um, oh, excellent example. So you don't realize this, but, but on your underlying operating system is a copy of Python and some of the libraries. And so you might often be handed something that depends on that operating system component. Uh, I ran into this problem with Max, funny enough, and Perl uh, going back to the day. So when you then update your operating system, it will update these operating system components. And something you didn't realize that depended on, on one of these components doesn't work anymore because it, you know, it's written for an out-of-date library or a library that's now effectively out of date because it's been up-revved on the Mac or on the Windows machine and it's broken something that you're building to. So you need to kind of isolate these environments so that they're not dependent on operating system, on third party things that they can't control. Does that answer the question? Actually, I was asking, no, it's great. It's, it's great, great answer. And I understand that from a system point of view, but I was thinking of, um, who said it? I think it was Anu. Adita, I, I'm going to mispronounce the name, Adita Basso. Oh, wait, that's right. And Adita, that's right. Can you, Ms. Basso, can you answer, can you give us an example of something that you think that you could break or are afraid of breaking? I think, um, I'll, I think I'll make sure that, um, that you can connect <laughs> about that. I'm sorry, we're going to, we're going to move on if that's okay. I apologize, Robert. Um, um, sorry, but about that. Uh, so, Let's take just a couple more questions. Uh, one from Chuck. Uh, for the typical total products used in the whole tool chain, is the cost less than that of a Thermomix? Definitely. It's all free. <laughs> well, everything I use is, is uh, open source, so it's... Nice. Um, 
you know, for those who don't know, know, probably all the young, younger people who don't know what the Thermomix is, but they're, they're, you have to take out a second mortgage in order to cut, buy one. And we don't have a Thermomix, I'm not a Thermomix proponent. Uh, it was just a convenient model. I think, I think it works quite well. It was a pretty Everybody. funny joke, Chuck. Or, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Hmm. Okay, Jerome, hi Jerome, asks, does Docker allow for better automation of something labor intensive, such as up-to-date screenshots? Not, if you can automate screenshots, you could automate it with Docker. Um, I'm trying to, trying to, I mean, it is isolated, so getting, so, you know, if you try to take sh which shots of a Windows screenshot, then that might be difficult because you have got access. If you are uh, able to display it using X, for instance, then it's easier because you, you know, you can run an, uh, an X client inside the Docker container and, and do a screenshot that way. But, but, uh, it's it's going to be very fiddly, uh, and it, yeah. But if you can do it, you can do it. If you can already do it without Docker, it's worth experimenting to see if it works with Docker. If you get stuck, uh, give me a point. I'll be interested to uh, see if I can help. Oh man, Jerome! If somebody can solve that problem for me, um, the company right. that can solve that problem first <laughs> will make so much money, right? <laughs> the idea is, it's probably it's like the juice is probably not worth the squeeze. <laughs> it's it's that comment. yeah okay i think i'll take one uh last question from francis which is how do you manage the edit and review passes for this content if someone suggests a change how is that done so so that's outside of the docker sort of workflow so i had a, i gave a talk at um at gitlab commit last year showing how to use the how to, how to use GitLab's issue tracker to so you know you use sort of normal issue issue tracker developer type tickets and and all that sort of workflow and then so this is just a small part of automating that that workflow process. Um, so you know, is that, I'm sort of over that I'm not sure. But basically, yeah, not using Doc, but using um, the sort of normal workflow like tickets and review pro, you know, signed off reviews and things like that. Yep. Um, okay, I lied. One last question, just because there's only one left. Um, this is from Michael. How well does or doesn't this method scale for high volume, high reuse content operations with multiple content types, multiple output formats, and multiple delivery channels? Uh, for various definitions of big, uh, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't scale. You might have to get fat, you know, if you want something done in a timely fashion, it's the same as building a big software product. Um, you know, if everything happens, you know, if there's lots of steps and they all have to happen one after another, and then you build for a different platform one after another, you know, that can take a, a long time. But if you start designing your, your process correctly and you start, you know, I only need to build for this platform to review, and I, you know, that's quick, and then for production, I need to do all of these, but I, I can parallelize them. Uh, you know, and, and then there's a, a trade off there because you're paying for resources to, to, do, to do that work in bigger machines. Uh, so it's it's the same set of problems that you have with building software uh, and how fast can I do it? Very good. All right. Well, I think that that's going to be our last question for the night. Um, first off, um, can I steal the screen share back from you really fast, Alec? <laughs> So first off, um, let's all, you can use your emojis or, or if you have your camera on your jazz hands and say thank you, Alec, for a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate that demo.